Hi, I'm Amy Hazel. Two different kinds of fish while you're saltwater fishing. You're going to have bottom feeders like the bonefish and the triggers. And then you have the predators. If you haven't hooked one, they take anything that we have in freshwater and make it look like a little baby. You can start with just getting one eight weight rod and one eight weight reel and start there and go on your first trip and have a blast. Hi, I'm Amy Hazel and I live in a little town in central Oregon called Maupin on the Deschutes River where I've been guiding uh, as a full-time guide since 1999 and I guide steelhead and trout on the Deschutes. We also guide on the John Day River. Um, my fly fishing journey began back a long time ago, but um, I really, really kind of had my cut my teeth in college. I went to college in Vermont at a small school called Middlebury and found in love with fly fishing out there and left school after graduating with an economics degree and naturally became a fly fishing guide. So that's just a little bit about me. I spent two years traveling around the world when I was 27 and 28 by myself fly fishing on the cheap. Uh, and so that was where I had my first taste of saltwater fishing. And I didn't have a ton of gear, but I had enough gear and enough saltwater flies to make, to have, to have fun exploring. Our fly shop, which is called Deschutes Angler, we have a huge fly shop with tons of gear. We're happy to help anyone get, get situated for any kind of trip, no matter where you're going. If you're going to the Caribbean, if you're going saltwater fishing in Africa, if you're going to the South Pacific, if you're going to the Bahamas, we've got all the stuff to help help you out. And, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So I just got back from Belize and uh, that was a picture of us in the boat and we were on a guided trip uh, out of a lodge. So a lot of times you'll go on a trip and you might be guided every day for a week. You might have just two or three days set aside to be guided. Maybe you're not guided at all. Maybe it's do it yourself. So there's a lot of different kind of trips. I have found that the most productive way to catch saltwater fish is to be guided every day. Uh, the guides can see really well. They can, they, they know where to go. You're, you're really in the best hands. If you can afford to get a guide every day, do that. All right, let's talk about gear. So this is actually my bag while I was packing for the Belize trip, but this is a Christmas Island packing list that I put down here. So if you're going through an organization like a travel company, or if you're booking with the lodge directly, they should have a packing list for you. The packing list is really helpful because it just takes all the guesswork out of it. And you don't want to pack too much. Uh, you you want to kind of bring the bare minimum and it. It doesn't look like it here, but oftentimes when I'm doing these trips, I'm trying to bring enough stuff for people in case their stuff breaks. So there, but uh, having a packing list is absolutely essential that you go through that packing list and step by step make sure you're bringing everything that you need for what you want to do. So the rod and reel selection is going to always depend on what fish you're targeting. So you might go to a destination like let's take Christmas Island, for example, uh, where bonefish is, is the main gig there, but they also have trigger fish, which you see in the upper left-hand picture. They have golden trevally. They have giant trevally down in the bottom of the picture there. Um, they have all kinds of fish. So when I go there, I know that I want to fish for everything. Uh, so I bring an eight weight. I bring nine weight. I bring a 10 weight. I bring a 12 weight and I bring a backup 12 weight, a backup 10 weight, a backup nine weight, a backup eight weight, maybe two. So I'm bringing a lot of stuff just because I'm usually hosting the trip and I want to make sure that I can come into the rescue for someone whose rod might break. Typically now for bonefish, we're going to use seven or eight weight rods. Sometimes down in the Caribbean, there are places that have a little bit smaller bonefish. You might use a six weight, but generally speaking, seven or eight weight rod. And you want to make sure that the rod that you're getting for saltwater fishing is saltwater worthy, meaning it doesn't have a wood reel seed and nice silver um, fittings because those are gonna just get completely ruined in the salt water. The salt water needs like an anodized reel seat where you attach your reel to the rod. So make sure that your rod is actually a saltwater worthy rod. Um, 
for permit, triggerfish, milkfish, baby tarpon, snook, jacks. I mean, you, you're going to get to know your species, redfish, uh, it's rooster fish. You're going to use like nine or 10 weight rods on those fish. And then for really big tarpon, really big giant trevally and tuna, you might want to have a 12 weight. Now, most people I know have a real struggle casting a 12 weight and I am including all the men I know in that category. So the 12 weight can be a really tough rod to cast. And so for a lot of people, that's not a rod that you're going to even want to take with you. I take a ton of people to a destination where they only bring one rod, they bring an eight weight and they have a great time. They catch a ton of fish. They catch all different kinds of species and they're, they're just having a, a absolute blast the whole time because they know what they want to target and they're going to stick with what's in their wheelhouse. Casting an eight weights a lot easier or a seven weights a lot easier than the very big rods that we get into. What about rod actions? Is there any specific, like my thought with a rod action for saltwater? Yeah. <laughs> well, typically saltwater rods are going to be faster action rods. So what that means is they're going to be stiffer, which makes, which is good for fighting fish because you need the power in the rod to fight fish. Saltwater fish, you guys, if you haven't hooked one, they take anything that we have in freshwater and make it look like a little baby. Okay, like uh, uh, a five pound bonefish would make a 12 pound steelhead cry like a little baby. They're really, really powerful fish. And that's one huge appeal to going fishing for them. But you need a stiff rod not only to fight the fish, but because a lot of times we're using really big flies, weighted flies, heavy flies, bulky flies, long feathery flies, um, crab patterns that are kind of bulky in it feels kind of like you're casting a large marble. It's really weird to cast these heavy flies, especially after you've been just dry fly fishing. So you, you know, that's one reason you want a a heavier duty rod, a stronger, stiffer rod in the saltwater that and fighting fish, but throwing big flies. It's sort of like when we go bass fishing on the John day, you, you need a big rod, not because the fish are big, but because the flies are big that we're popping. So that's, that's where fly selection. So then you need a reel. This is my pile of rods that I take with me saltwater fishing. I don't use them any other time. They just, they just sit and you need a reel for each rod, but you don't need a reel for every backup rod. I do bring backup reels. I bring multi not multiple reels mainly because I have different lines on them and I don't know if I want to have floating line or a sinking line. Most places where you go, I'd say floating line is absolutely fine. I put a spool of tip in the middle of all those reels so that you can see the size of the reels. The saltwater reels are generally going to be the biggest reels that you own. Uh, They need to be big in order to have a lot of backing capacity because saltwater fish will take you two or 300 yards into your backing. They also need to be large um, because the lines are a little bit larger. You get into a 12 weight line, it's 500 and 50 grains. I mean, that's going to take up a ton of room on your reel. So for those of you who ever have gotten into spay casting or want to get into spay casting, when you purchase the reel for your spay rod, think about your future hopes of going saltwater fishing and get a reel that is able to handle saltwater. Not all reels can do do as well in saltwater. You want to have some kind of sealed drag, although I don't think that any drag is 100% sealed. You do want a really good disc drag. You don't want a click and paw reel. You don't want something flimsy. The reel is the thing that's going to stop the fish and give you a chance to land them. So you definitely want to get the best reels that you can. I get reels from a lot of different companies. That's why I have a variety there. Um, The bright colors are kind of fun. I've got red, purple, blue, another blue one. That that also helps you differentiate your stuff from everybody else's when it's on a boat. And I'll show you a picture of that later. Um, So this is overwhelming. The first thing that you see is all this gear and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this. Well, there are companies that rent gear. You can start with just getting one eight weight rod and one eight weight reel and start there and go on your first trip and have a blast catching a ton of different species 
uh, without necessarily having to get all these rods. This takes years. It's like camping gear. It takes years to build up all your camping gear. You don't just go to the store and buy it all. So you guys will, will build it up um, one at a time. But there are companies that rent. Some lodges that you go to will actually either have free rentals or charge you to rent. And then there are other lodges that you go to that don't have anything. They don't have flies. They don't have leaders. They don't have rods. And that's Christmas Island is one of those places. So you've got to bring everything with you. So anything can happen out there in the salt water. You see this beautiful trigger fish. This, this woman here, that was her first trigger fish. She was super excited and it was facing the camera. And then in the upper right-hand corner pick, it turned and bit her rod in half. It just destroyed her rod because it was angry that she, she messed with it. So these trigger fish, they're funny. They have these little funny human teeth. But I mean, this is unusual, but anything can happen in the salt water. I've seen rods break for the dumbest reasons and it can happen. So it is good to bring a backup or go with someone who brought a backup. So this is how I carry my rods and reels on the plane. You can see I have tons of leaders in the upper part of the, the bag there. Yes, thank you for pointing there, Heather. I have tippet, I have reels, and then I have rods. And these rods are all out of their metal cases. They're just in the rod bags. And I can stack like six, seven, or even eight of them in here uh, if I'm taking a ton of rods. And the TSA agents will have to pry this out of my cold, dead hands when I go through security because I will not let them gate check this. I always make sure that this stays with me. Now, to that end, you want to be careful with what you put in there. You don't want to put nippers in there. You don't want to put forceps in there. You don't want to put pliers in there. You've got to check a bag if you're going to bring those tools. And we're going to talk about that in a sec. But this is a great bag. When you go to popular fly fishing destinations, you will see bags that look like this. We always get asked if we're bringing ukuleles to Hawaii, but they're not ukuleles. Fly rods, reels, and we, of course, need lines and leaders. So the lines, of course, are going to match the rod that you're using. And I typically tell people that a minimum of two leaders for each setup. So if you're bringing an eight weight and a 10 weight, bring a minimum of two leaders one that you're going to start with and one that you're going to have for a backup. You also want to bring tippet. A lot of the guides don't have this stuff. So don't rely on them to have this stuff. When they want to put new tippet on, let them tie the knots, let them do all the tippet replacement, let them tie your flies on, but be sure that you bring, bring the tippet material. I use fluorocarbon in the salt water. It's not absolutely necessary, but one reason that I really like fluoro, well, a couple of reasons, it's super strong. It doesn't go bad the way nylon will get brittle and go bad in time. So some of these spools I've had since before the pandemic, when I got to travel a lot more frequently, um, and they'll just, they'll last for years, these fluorocarbon spools. So get, get good tippet and you'll have it for many, many trips to come. These are special leaders. They're kind of crumpled up because they've been on a lot of trips and they've never actually been out of the bag. But these are for toothy critters like this barracuda that I'm holding here. If you're fishing for fish that have a ton of sharp little teeth, you want to have these wire tipped leaders. And for that matter, a lot of these fish we're catching like as we're trolling from spot to spot, this one happened to swim up on the flat and I cast to it. But if you're trolling from spot to spot, and we did, we do this a lot in certain places. I've done it in Belize and Honduras and Mexico and other places. You can troll while you're going from spot to spot. And suddenly you catch a six, six foot long barracuda. It's pretty cool. Anyway, that's a special leader for barracuda. They have swivels on them so that your fly line doesn't get all spun up. Flies. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a crazy fly person. This is one of about 12 boxes that I took to Belize. Now, in reality, how many flies do you use on a, on a saltwater trip? Mm, e, five, <laughs> maybe 10. But you should see the guide's eyes light up when I bring this box to them of all these flies I've tied because then they get, they get to choose. Like they, they know what colors work. Sometimes it's tan, sometimes it's olive. They kind of know what they're looking for in a pattern. I spend 
most of my time just giving these flies to the guides. I let them just pick as many as they want. A lot of my, a lot of these are my own original creations. So I also drive guides crazy because I'm constantly wanting to fish my own stuff to see if I can get it to work, to see if I can popularize the fly. That leads to a lot of rejection sometimes, but that that's a whole nother story. Um, so I usually bring a big fly box like that. And then I bring a bunch of other smaller boxes. So I have that big one I'll have in my gear bag all the time on the boat, but I don't, I don't carry that with me. I carry with me one, one or two boxes, like in the next slide. And this one happens to be waterproof, which is really nice because sometimes you get excited and forget to completely close your bag and it gets water in it and you don't want all your flies to rust. Another type of box I use is a foam box and it's just light, it's lightweight. But what I do is I usually pick my team for the day and I get all the flies that I think I'm going to use for that day. And I leave the boxes of flies in my boat bag on the boat. These are kind of typical bonefish fly patterns and a lot of them look like tiny shrimp. And these are typical bait fish patterns. So you're going to run into kind of needlefish will destroy your, your flies instantly. If you've ever fished down in Mexico or some places in the Caribbean where you get needlefish and barracuda will destroy your fly instantly. So if you don't want your fly destroyed, don't cast to the three foot barracuda or needlefish. These are all flies with eyes on them and, and the predators, they really key into eyes. And if you don't have good glue and your eyes fall off, you may as well throw them throw the fly away because it won't work if it doesn't have an eyeball. Eyeballs are key. This is really the reason that I have to check a bag every time because I do bring my pliers. I bring nippers. I bring forceps. I bring a nail knot tool. I also bring, so, and I bring those things because a lot of guides don't have any tools at Christmas Island. Now you go to Belize, they bring their tools, but I always bring my tools every day in the boat because I mean, one day my guide forgot his, his pliers and his nippers. So I had them with me and I just handed them to him because he was doing all the changing of the flies. You also want to bring your tools for your reels. Some reels have special tools that help you open them up and you want to be able to open up your reel just in case you need to rinse it out or you get some sand or grit or something in that. So be sure you bring your tools for your reels. So this is my method on the boat. I have a backpack, which is bright orange. And I put my fly boxes and sunscreen and stuff that I'm going to be monkeying around with on the boat in there. Now this, and this is when I'm on a flats trip. So there's two kinds of trips. And I think Heather's going to talk about it a little bit too, but there's, you're either going to be fishing out of a boat the whole time, which is what I did in Belize. And you can do some waiting on some flats in some areas in Belize. And then there are places where you don't fish off the boat at all. It's all wading, all flats, all sandy bottom. And that happens a lot, I think, in the Bahamas. I've never been to the Bahamas, but I know that happens in the Bahamas. It definitely happens at Christmas Island. Not so much in Belize, but in some places in Belize, yeah, there's some really good wade fishing. And uh, Honduras, I've done some wade fishing. In Mexico, there's some wade fishing. But there's also a lot of places where you fish out of a boat. So if you're fishing out of a boat, you might not need two bags, but if you're fishing out of a boat and wading flats, I usually leave one bag in the boat and it might have snacks, my uh, water bottles, uh, it might have whatever, like tons of flies, first aid stuff, aspirin just in case, or Advil or whatever, all that kind of stuff in case someone on the boat gets a headache. And then I wear the gray bag. And I've made the mistake. I own one of these sling packs that's bright orange. Don't wear that on the flat. You're going to have every fish within a five mile radius running away, screaming when they, they see that bright orange bag on your hip or on your back on the flats. Same with buffs. I've, I've bought some really cute buffs over the years and some of them have scared the heck out of the fish. So watch out for the color. It might be cute but it, it, might, it might really impact your fishing. Critically important, if you want to see fish, you have to have good optics. I highly recommend that you get sunglasses that have glass lenses and they will not scratch as easily as polycarb. They must be polarized. And my personal preference is an amber or copper lens when you're fishing flats 
And then like a gray or a blue lens, if you're going to be out blue water fishing. One thing I always bring, I go to Costco and I get those wipe and clear lens wipes and I bring enough to have to use like two or three a day and I share them with my guide so I can clean my glasses. My friend can clean her glasses and the guide can clean his or her glasses with the same cloth if we just share it and pass it around. So they're alcohol based cleaning cloths and I did a before and after on my filthy sunglasses right there and you can see how nice it how nicely it cleans them. If you wear contact lenses, you might want to bring a pair of prescription sunglasses just in case something goes wrong with your contacts and you want to be able to see. I do have prescription contacts. So I bring two non-prescription and one prescription pair of glasses, but sunglasses, you cannot skimp on those, you guys, because with the right sunglasses, you're going to see the fish your guide is pointing to. And, and if you don't have good sunglasses, it's going to be a struggle. Aim also two pairs of sunglasses. Cause two sometimes, pairs of sunglasses. sometimes they end up going in the drink, unfortunately. So. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I would definitely always have a retainer on the sunglasses that you wear around your neck after you're done fishing. And before you get together with your friends at the bar, take your sunglasses off and leave them in the room. Because you're going to hug people and these sunglasses are going to just burst into a million pieces. I've seen it happen on every saltwater trip. So, you know, if you're going to get rowdy with your gal friends, just leave your sunglasses in your, in your room. This is also critically important. Obviously, we're fishing pretty close to the equator in a lot of these saltwater destinations. So I wasn't trying to get in too much into the clothing, but... The buff, I think, is the a buff or a neck scarf or a snood or whatever you have that you can wear around your neck that can cover your ears, go up over the top of your head. It helps hold your hat on while you're racing from spot to spot in the boat. And these buffs are awesome sun protection. Bring more than one because they get nasty after like wearing them for a couple of days. So you can bring one, wash one, let it dry while you're wearing one, whatever, but bring more than one. In terms of sunscreen here, most of the sunscreen that I show here is reef safe, but some of it isn't. And that is a big deal if, if you're waiting and that sunscreen is going to be coming off you and in, directly into the water. And I think it's, it's a big deal anytime. Not all these are reef safe. That was pointed out to me by my friend, Jenny. But I do really like having a face stick. So you see, uh, you'll see I'm throughout here in these pictures that it's like a deodorant stick. I'm sure you guys have used one. You rub it right onto your skin and you can get them with zinc. You can get them for sensitive skin, SPF 90, SPF 50. Um, that's usually what I use because then I don't have to touch the sunscreen with my hands. I can roll that sunscreen on multiple times a day onto my, the back of my hands, uh, onto my ears, onto my neck, under my nose, and just constantly keep refreshing the sunscreen throughout the day. If you have to use the sunscreen that you wipe on, be sure you have a way to wipe it off. All right, let's talk about bugs. If any of you are on a trip with me, I have great news for you. The bugs probably won't bother you because they're going to be busy with me. I'm one of those people that the bugs, um, they love me. And at a lodge with 16 people, I'll be wearing long pants every day, socks to dinner with sandals, and um, Vicks VapoRub, DEET, um, a bunch of other funky kind of things. I'll be eating Vegemite and Marmite, trying to make my skin smell bad or whatever, but it doesn't matter. The flies love me. This was a picture from Belize last week. We had a beautiful um, cabin looking over this nice fishable flat. And I would have to run from the cabin into the lodge because <laughs> sand flies were pretty bad. Sand flies, mosquitoes, deer, deer flies or horse flies. Um, those are pretty much what you'll find out there. And it can, they can be on you while you're fishing, if you're fishing in the mangroves. But most of the time, it's when you're land-based, especially sand flies. 
Um, so definitely bring some stuff. Saltwater. So this boat picture, these are the types of boats we use at Christmas Island and your fly, fly rod will be hanging up there kind of traveling all day with the salt air kind of getting on them. So your saltwater lines are going to get sticky. And if you just bring a couple of fly line cleaning toilet uh, towelettes that, that are like a couple bucks a pack, we can clean your lines midweek and get them nice and slick again. That makes them float. And it's just the way to go. Flats boots. Okay. There are places where you can get away with those little water shoes, but most places I've been, you cannot get away with, with little neoprene booties that you might go scuba diving in. You need soles on your boots. They don't have to be flats boots from a company like Sims. You can, you can buy lightweight hiking boots. You could use Converse tennis shoes. Um, Sims was out of stock on, on boots. And so is Patagonia. My husband bought some like lightweight army ranger boots with good soles on them. They were lightweight. They were 50 bucks. They worked fine for the few minutes that we waited in Belize. Um, but at Christmas Island, these boots have been through three weeks at Christmas Island and they probably have two more weeks left in them. And then they're, they're done because we're walking on coral a lot of the times, really sharp coral. So you don't want to skimp on your foot protection if you're on a waiting trip. If you're going somewhere, you might want to ask how much will we be waiting and how much will we be fishing from the boat? Because I swear I had a pair of flats boots for about five years before I even put them on my feet for the first time, lugged them all over the place and didn't really fish any anything out of the boat until then we started to. So the finger stripping guards that you see on my fingers there, all that is, is vet wrap. You can get it at any horse store. You can get it at any veterinarian office and I just slice it. So I put this, it, it adheres to itself and it keeps my fingers from getting burns on them when I'm stripping saltwater fly line through my fingers all day long. Um, that it's a cheap way to do it. You can also buy gloves that have leather guards in them. They're also service sun gloves. I don't really like those as much. So I just wrap my fingers up every morning and then take that off at night. Here's a typical like toiletries that I'll bring on a saltwater trip. Your standard toothbrush, toothpaste, Q-tips, soap, uh, lip stuff for sure. Make sure it's SPF 30. Lots of hair rubber bands, earplugs, just in case you don't know if your roommate's going to be a snorer. I bring my prescription in the prescription bottle that because sometimes they'll want to look at that at the at customs. Deodorant, face stuff. I bring contact lenses that are daily use contacts. And if those of you who wear contact lenses have never used those kind, they're awesome for trips because you don't have to bring any solution. You wear them one day, you throw them away. It's pretty nice. At the bottom of the page there, you see that stuff that says for her and body and then the Johnson's baby powder. What that is, is that's like a, a anti chafe balm that helps you when you're walking seven miles a day in wet pants in salt water, you can get what we refer to in our little guide world here as JR, which stands for jungle rot, which means you have got chafing between your legs so bad that it's hard to walk unless you walk around like an orangutan. So to prevent that, you want to put that kind of anti-chafing stuff on, or you can use baby powder, gold bond, whatever floats your boat. That's just stuff you bring on the trip. I am a total freak about drinking safe water. And when I, when I check into a place and they say our, our drinking water is safe to drink right out of the tap, I'm like, all right, I bet it is. Thanks. But I spent two years traveling around the world and I didn't get sick because I'm really, really, really careful about the water I drink. So a lot of these places will have reverse osmosis filters. Um, they'll have water that's filtered and is probably pretty darn safe to drink. I filter it one more time. And I either do that with a Steri pen, which is a UV pen, or I have a water filter that I actually, it's like a French press. And I just press 
the water through the filter and then I fill up my water bottle that just keeps me hydrated. I don't feel worried about drinking the water and you're not going through tons of plastic water bottles. First aid kit, your host of your trip, if you have a host should bring that. If nothing else, you should bring some, some wound treatment because a coral cut and any kind of open wound in the tropics is no joke. Certain lodges you'll go to, they have medical stuff. You don't have to worry. You go remote, you want to bring some first aid stuff. I, I now travel with Dayquil, NyQuil, and Pepto-Bismol, Imodium AD, Cipro, if you can get your hands on it. The Dayquil, NyQuil was because I caught, a, I caught the flu on the way down to Christmas Island one time and spent almost the entire weeks, two weeks in bed, not fishing in a, you know, in the tropics, when you have a fever of 104 and there's no medical facilities, I, I wished I had brought that stuff and I had someone bring it in the second week, but you definitely want to have like cold medication. You never know what you're going to catch on the plane, probably less now that we're wearing masks on the plane, but I wore a mask on my next trip, that trip down there. And I, I was the only one wearing a mask. I always bring a fishing journal on the trip. Um, you guys might find this funny. I like to take notes. I like to, to record what happened every day and who was my guide. Um, I also try to learn the language of places I go. So those are words that, um, words that come in handy to know when you're wanting to try to speak the language. Um, I write down which rods I took to, so that I know what, when I'm packing up again, I know if I've loaned some stuff out, I can get it all back. And then I write down guides names and what I remember about them. And so that when we go back, I can remember their names because the names of the guides at Christmas Island, for example, can be really out there like Ikiawea and, and, you know, they, they have, they have long weird names, hard names to remember. So you write them down and you get to know them well. So that's a good idea. And then it's always a good idea to have a pen with you when you're traveling chargers. Obviously, we have things, electronics that we need to charge up. Some places you go, you can use your good old U.S. currents or U.S. Uh, plug. Other places have crazy weird plugs, Australian plugs. The farther you get, you never know what you're going to get in your room. So I just bring one of those no matter where I go. It can be adjusted to any kind of plug-in. The flat thing in the middle, that's actually a phone charger that doesn't require you to plug your phone in. I took a brand new iPhone to the salt water and walked around with it in my pocket because it was waterproof and it got wet all week and it won't charge with the cord when that happens. Just FYI, you might want to have a wireless charger. I bring a, a headlamp everywhere I go. Power outages are not uncommon. I bring playing cards because that's fun. And then that's that scale that you see down at the bottom, that has saved my bacon a million times because I can accurately weigh my luggage. And certain airline carriers are incredibly strict about your luggage weight. So when I'm bringing all this gear, I want to make sure that I'm not over 50 pounds. And that thing gives me peace of mind because it's a handle that you lift up your luggage with. They're probably easy to find. Last couple of things, we need to bring masks. Um, just assume that there's a mask policy when you get off the plane in whatever country you get off in. In Belize, it was a $500 fine if you didn't have a mask on indoors or out, except if you were like eating in a bar. So you didn't mess around with that. They had police everywhere. And I think it's a good thing. I wish we were a little stricter here, but this is all you really need for traveling people. Passport and cash. Now, the reason I'm showing the cash here is because you want to bring enough cash to cover your tips and then a little bit more. You just, it doesn't hurt to have a little extra cash with you. I change my money into the local denomination when we go to Christmas Island. I change my money into Australian dollars because they don't care whether you give them one US dollar or one Australian dollar but I can get 140 Australian dollars for 100 US dollars. So I get 43 dollars for every hundred I bring. And that 
Tipping, basically, you want to know, uh, if you want to know what to tip, that should be in any paperwork. Any lodge is going gonna, is gonna to help you out with that. Some places, saltwater guides get tipped like 20 to $30 or $40 for the boat. Other places, you tip them $100 for the boat. So if you have two people in the boat, they each tip 50. You just kind of want to find out what the policy is on tipping. And I think that's everything. I think that's my last slide.